here's a game that you can make and play at home. This video will show you how to do both. The idea started on the bathroom floor with the question, what if you were to play two simple games at the same time on the same board? Let's think about that. The object of the game is simple. Get to the opposing square. Notice that four of your pieces are on squares and four of them are on octagons and they have to stay that way. And so in order to get to this square, you'll have to use one of these four pieces. In a normal move, any one of your pieces can be moved to a similar space. But you can move over the game board much more quickly by jumping. The rule is that you can jump over any piece, even if it's not the same type, as long as the piece is your own. There are some limitations though. No double jumping and no jumping over the opponent's pieces. The game can also be won by capturing the opponent's pieces. Before I explain how this can be done, I should mention that the bridges in the game's title refer to these lines that connect all of the corners of the squares. These bridges link the squares together, so they're treated as though they're touching in the same way that the octagons do. This means that a space on the board has up to eight places where another piece could be around it. When one of those positions has an enemy piece on it, then it's considered a threat. Once a piece is under three threats, it's captured. Capture might look like this, or like this, or like this, 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 as long as it's any three of the eight possible adjacencies. A simpler way to explain is to just say that when you surround a piece with three of the other pieces, it can be captured. Although the pieces that are on octagons can't actually capture the end square, they're still instrumental as weapons in this game, and so the exchange between pieces becomes pretty complex, and it makes for a fun game. As with any game, the best way to learn is to just simply play, and so at the end of this video there will be some gameplay footage to help you get started down that path. If you have further questions about how to play, there's a three-page rule sheet, link is in the description, of course it's free, and there's also a printable template, which will help us to get started to build one of these. The project begins with a piece of one quarter inch plywood. Any thickness will work though. For my piece, I'm going to use the back side, just because I like this dark grain pattern. first thought might be, let's make the second cut this way by just pushing it through. But notice that the piece being cut off is much larger than the piece we're working with. This is cross-cutting against the fence and it's typically a no-no. Admittedly, I do this sometimes, especially with thin material like this, but just remember, any cut that you can make, you can make a different way. A table saw is not necessary. I have here a couple of inexpensive clipboards. They're about a dollar or so a piece, and they're made from some thin fiberboard. And coincidentally, it's about exactly the size that we want to make our game board. And so let's use one to trace the other and make a square. Hopefully, if we score both sides of it, it will snap off nice and clean. And if not, there's always sandpaper. You can use this to keep score with, I guess. Next up, the printed game board. By marking out the length and width of a piece of office paper, 
we can cut similar pieces that can then be used in a printer. A roll of brown craft paper like this one is not very expensive, but we don't need much, so a single paper grocery bag will be enough for this project. Paper can be trained to go the other way. Now it's time to attach the game to the board, and I shall call it the game board. Since there are three of them to do, I'm just going to use spray adhesive again because it's quick and easy. But we can explore some alternatives like wood glue, white glue, and decoupage. Real quick, conclusions. The white glue was probably the weakest bond. It started to lift a little bit when I used the piece of pipe to roll it. The wood glue was the strongest bond, but it has a slightly yellow color to it. And the decoupage probably worked the best. It has the clearest look and just seems to be the best suited to this project. Notice that none of the three glues really darkened the color of the paper. And that's because they didn't penetrate into the fibers, as did the polyurethane that I used to top coat this. That's something that you should consider before you choose which glue or which top coat to use. In the case of the podge, you can just keep adding subsequent coats to get your top coat protection. Polyurethane has to saturate the wood fibers, and in doing so, it gives it that nice dark color. And we don't want our glue to interfere with that. Long story short, do some experimentation because the glue will act as a barrier that will keep the polyurethane from soaking into the fibers of the paper. With spray glue, even a relatively heavy coat is easy to keep on one side. Dab around the ends first so that you don't snag them. And now we just keep wiping it down as though we were trying to get all of that polyurethane back off and it will give us a nice satin finish. Let's look at the results. We'll start with my favorite. These two were both done the same way. They're polyurethane on plywood. I gave them a second coat of semi-gloss polyurethane with a paintbrush just to make it nice since there are hundreds of you looking at this. Both of these two were made out of clipboard material. This one also given some semi-gloss polyurethane with a brush and it turned out really nicely. And this one was done entirely with decoupage. Be warned that decoupage is an art in itself. So how to do it perfectly is really beyond the scope of this video. But just as a crash course, the big problem you're likely to encounter with it is with the bubbles. The paper sometimes doesn't always want to stay flat on the board. It is possible to both stick the paper down and top coat it all at the same time. 
but it's not a guarantee that you'll be able to press out all of the wrinkles. Experimenting with a heat gun does seem to soften those wrinkles so that you can press them out easier. But honestly, the most reliable method just seems to be using patience and applying less adhesive at a time. This way, you can just apply as many thin coats as you want until you achieve the finish that you're after. If you sharpen a pipe on one end, you can then spin it in a drill in order to cut perfect pieces of foam, felt, or rubber. Next, these are stuck to a piece of upside-down tape, and then they're given some spray glue. Now we have some optional feet that we can use for both our game board and the play pieces, which, by the way, are just some craft store vase filler. And these are sometimes also called glass gems, and they usually only cost around a penny a piece. And that brings us finally to gameplay. Here are two games for you to watch. This will get you started thinking about the game. Both of us made mistakes in these games, and that's okay, because we didn't want the games to become too complex, or they would be difficult to follow. Okay, so no music or talking here, so that you can rewind and watch again and think about it. Hope you enjoy. In case you enjoy games like this, I have others. Try Isopath, I'm especially fond of that one. I have a video about it, click here. And before you go, please let me know it if you try playing this game. Let me know if you enjoyed it. And also, one final thought, try experimenting with four player.